I suppose in uh, religion, as it starts, there's a kind of duality. And uh, the philosopher Descartes emphasized this duality with the philosophy of dualism, scientific philosophy, that said that there are two things. There is nature and there is God. These are two separate things. And uh, or there is nature and there is something beyond. So this is a, a certain way of looking at things because it does seem that there is a, a being that is a creator separate from us doing the creation and so on but really uh, when you look at it from a vedanta point of view you're looking at a whole range of ideas that are designed to be progressive we lead one idea to another in other words in Swami Vivekananda's language, we don't go from error to truth, we go from truth to higher truth. We don't say that anything is wrong, and we agree with everyone, provided they're prepared to be broad-minded enough to put a plus on. So the materialists will say, this world is all that exists. They'll look around and say, well, we can't see God, we can't determine whether he is acid or alkaline whether he's a this or that, and so therefore we are skeptical and we are therefore called atheist. But you see, they're accepting a dualistic position and many commentators will say, well, I also don't believe in the God that you don't believe in because that's not the kind of God that we believe in. And so those people then may cite a kind of dualism, another kind of dualism, which says that there is a connection between the creation and the creator. And then as our understanding opens up, we can also describe this, by the way, in Jesus' language of the Father in heaven, in other words, I am separate from the Father, but then I am the vine and you are the... And I'm the vine and you're the branches, that kind of thing. In other words, there is a connection, a spark of the divine. We see a connectedness. And it's this connectedness that you're probably describing as Mother Nature. That there is a Mother Nature and we would say, absolutely yes. But we cannot leave it there. Technically, that is called pantheism. But pantheism and physicalism are identical because we have to say that this nature is not a self-operating system. It requires something that is there that makes it work. Now, if we are to understand this whole pattern of existence, we really have to look at the geography as described with by Kapila in his Sankhya, adopted also by the yoga system, of 24 principles. And by understanding these 24 principles, we can go progressively to finer and finer ways of thinking and finer and finer truths. Without eliminating the one, we catch on to the next one. Like a chameleon, for example, or some kind of being that catches onto a branch and lets go the other side and progressively does this. Or climbing a ladder, we let go one rung in order to uh, advance and grasp the one above us, and so it goes on. Very rarely we would simply fly to the top. We have to do things progressively, and in spiritual teaching, all good teachers will I understand where are you now, and please go to your next step, and the next step, and the next step. I don't know if you know that game of snakes and ladders, a little bit like that. You put a dice there and you progress and you go up a ladder and that gives you a rapid advance until you come across a snake and then that puts you back to square one. The mind is like that. A determined mind says, let me play the game 
And then it says, oh, I only want ladders. I don't want the other things. So nature provides us with both of these things. And nature is a nurturing thing from a point of view of driving us forward, giving us the opportunity for growth, leading us by the hand, if you like, and progressing us on this we call evolution. And if we take this in a motherly way, we can see that the mother is doing this for us so that even the things which we don't like are lessons. We learn much more from pain than we learn from anything else. So we're all advancing, all progressing, whether we like it or not, until our philosophy tells us that every single creature, every atom will access its own freedom eventually. And in the grand scheme of things, after trillions and trillions and eons of years, human years, everything will go back and dissolve into one equilibrium. This, in fact, is called one day of Brahma, one day of the Creator. And then that state of layer of potentiality goes on for another night of Brahma. And so the whole thing is, if you take one cycle where every age gets progressively shorter and shorter and shorter and more and more difficult with more obstacles in the way then we can calculate our own era consisting of let us say well one cycle consisting of 4.3 billion years human years earth years that is times by a thousand that is one day of brahma one night will be the same equivalent. Now we have no idea about that because such large numbers we can't even think of, but there are many things we cannot think of. We cannot think of the vast extent of the entire universe. We can hardly think that we are simply dot, an important dot somewhere in the darkness of space. And that space is so dilute, there's hardly anything in it really in terms of density. Density is very little. We can hardly imagine this subatomic world of excited excitations in Hilbert space is how it's described. It's all abstract. Abstract because we cannot even imagine it. But the point is all the principles in nature apply to ourselves when we consider ourselves as psychophysical beings, something with a body. If we take for granted that perhaps this identity of the body is not correct, and we shift our perspective and say that we can cross a border and we can become bodiless, completely bodiless, in a kind of adventurous dream world. And then we can lapse into a creative potentiality. What are we doing? We are reenacting this whole drama that is taking trillions and trillions of human years. This one day of Brahma we are describing. And so it's in our little life that it's happening. And behind it is a witness. These are called the four states, but there's really another state. And the other state is like this. Supposing somebody offers me a piece of land just as a donation. Will I take it? I will surely take it. Then if somebody gives me that, no doubt, somebody else will give me a plow. Somebody else will give me advice on gardening make a flower garden, and so on. If unasked that happens, when I deliberately put in a conscious thought about it, what will happen? I can create something using the internal creativity which is there, that center of poise where thought becomes a suction. All I have to do is meditate on it and create my own reality. And this is really called visualization and so on, let's call it meditation, if you will, is another state of being. Now that means, therefore, that if I'm confident about controlling this internal nature, this how Swami Vivekananda describes as internal nature, if I'm capable of doing that, I will also control external nature. But it requires an element of faith. What is that faith? That this complex universe, this whole of nature, 
there's something not only profoundly uh, rhythmic within it, causal within it, there's something like a mother manifesting love everywhere and creating such a harmony that it also involves destruction. It involves not only creation, it involves sustaining thing, and it also involves destruction. All these three are necessary. If it wasn't like that, then we would have a difficult universe. We take food in for our nourishment. The cells take it, and whatever waste product is there, they get rid of it. This is the whole organic pattern, and it's the pattern everywhere. It's the pattern of even galaxies and stars and so on. Stars will burn out, and new stars are created. This whole endeavor of appearance and disappearance is there, and this is nature. And it is all in the interests of rhythm, harmony, and purpose. This is the motherly aspect, and that is why we call this Mother Nature. Of course, when we say Mother Nature, we're thinking of flowers and trees and mountains and fields. But we shouldn't forget that you also are part of this nature in terms of the apparatus called the body, the apparatus called the mind, all of that. So now, is there something more? Don't forget, we're a system of pluses. Yes, there's something more than that. There's more than pantheism. There's panentheism. That is, that we are accepting that the same thing, the same thing that is being manifested is the same supreme cause beyond our reach. The philosophical way of talking about it is that this absolute, this supreme, is not only a material force but an efficient cause. And then that is beyond our scope. This is the non-dualistic aspect when we leave all the other things behind. What does that mean? It means that if we experience this absolute, this fullness, we will not experience the relative. Let's put it another way. When we experience this non-duality, even for a moment, we will not experience the multiplicity that we call Mother Nature. So this Mother Nature and this Absolute are correlated. And the correlation is like this, that the Absolute we technically call Brahman, and we even qualify it by saying Nirguna, without any quality, without any uh, characteristics or anything of that nature. And then we have Saguna Brahman, that is, with characteristics and with qualities. So are these two different? They are not. They're one and the same. They're two sides of the same coin, if you want, but not exactly, because when you have the one, the other one is gone. And when you have the relative, the absolute is gone. Now, how do we reconcile these in our practical life? We have to understand the philosophy of it to start with. We have to understand that everywhere, every we, where we go, whatever, wherever the mind goes, it will understand a duality. It will understand a partial duality or non-duality. And it should also understand a unity which we call non-dualism as well. And that means we have to rehearse a thousand billion, billion, billion times the understanding, the process, take it out of abstract philosophy. And in order to do that, we have to formulate our own imagination from this creative area that is potential potentiality. So let us take people. Whatever person is presented to us, we'll have to understand, yes, there's a material layer. We agree with everybody that there's a material body. Then we also understand there is a subtle body behind it. There is a, something called an internal instrument with many different functions and faculties and parts. And then also there is this fundamental nature. And because this is Brahman, let us put it into a well-designed, well-inspired form that is our chosen ideal, with all the qualities of the chosen ideal, with all the beautiful, wonderful 
uh, attributes which are there, which we discover in our devotional life. In devotional life, we discover these attributes. And therefore, we have to say for ourselves that, yes, we have experienced the motherliness of our Ishta Devata. We have, we have dialogued. We have listened. We have spoken. We have faith. We understand that this is not only in everything, but is everything. If you have this point of view, what fear can there be? What doubt can there be? What temptation can there be? If we understand that everything is only the one thing, then uh, the definition, of course, of that fear will be faith in heredity. That is faith in your genetic makeup. And if you have faith in that genetic makeup, no doubt you'll be shaky. You'll be on shaky ground. And if you don't have trust, you'll have doubt. And if you feel that this relative world is all there is, then it will have a temptation element in it as well. These three factors serve as obstacles for you to truly understand what is there and understand the reality which is there. So there should be no confusion, therefore, because all these positions are true. When we worship the Divine Mother or any other aspect that we choose, with the qualities that we also are given to us, to our understanding. It is a real heart-to-heart -heart relationship. In Christian terminology, it is per the personal uh, relationship, a relationship with a personal God. And then when we explore that even further, we say the, see the intimacy where we see that everywhere. We see it in the whole of the rest of what we call the nature. And then when we see that further, perhaps in meditation, we we'll see there the oneness of it. And even outside that, we can feel it. We can resolve it into a oneness. Now this requires, of course, imagination, since there is no other means to deal with this, because our mind is not capable of taking space away and taking time away. It's not capable of understanding a unity of existence. And yet the search everywhere will be for that unity of existence, whether it's in the realm of science or physiology, it will be to find out what is that unity of existence. Even in the world of physics, which is trying to understand this nature, it will be exactly the idea of seeking for a unity, a generalization, the highest generalization that we have. So, for example, when we pray, we are praying with a particular entity, and that entity is cosmic mind in, in Sankhya terms. And that cosmic mind is a real person. It is the mind of God, if you will. It is God himself or herself manifesting, in other words, manifesting themselves as nature. The whole of nature is seemingly fragmented and divided God. If we don't see it like that, then we should make an effort to do that. And the best way is to pray for a revelation. Please give me faith. Please give me vision. Please let me see things in a different way. These things are necessary. So uh, then uh, in terms of uh, meditation we can explore that further. We can get more intimacy. We can see that this entity is not ours alone. This entity belongs everywhere. When we see it within ourselves we also see it within others. And when we sit for meditation we will see it in ourselves. But when we work in the working, waking, normal, so-called life, then we will see it in others. If we cannot see it, then uh, we will see only the, the, the dividedness and the fragmentation of it. And that will induce an element of defensiveness, an element of fear. It will it'll be a, a, a toss-up between two kinds of sections namely 
pleasure and pain, a tussle between these two things, and that requires attachment, and so it goes on, you see. So all attachment is associated with pleasure, and we're trying to look for that pleasure and ignore the deeper aspects. Now, if you have an awkward situation, that means if you have, let us say, a medical examination or something, and you may think, well, there are some possibilities of good news or bad news. What if there's bad news? Well, what if there's good news? How will we deal with it? The very place you're going to is nothing more than that supreme chosen ideal. The person you're speaking to is nothing more than God dressed up. It is God dressed up. And how do we know that? How do we really get to understand it? We have to rehearse that position a thousand, 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 billion, billion, trillion times. We have to rehearse it constantly. We have to keep connected with it through prayer, through japa, through uh, interspersing the day, through continuously keeping this contact, in short, to maintaining the presence of the divine. Practicing the presence, that's what is necessary, continuously. And seeing it everywhere. Now, what is the result of it? Joy. Joy is the result of it. Because every fear uh, comes with a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a, 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 um, a catch to it. And what is the catch? Well, fear inserts a fearful mind. Doubt inserts a doubtful mind. Joy inserts a joyful mind. Bliss inserts a blissful mind. It's entirely up to us. We should use our faculty of imagination to create the world we like, the world we want. And knowing that, the world as we understand it is nature and is pliable. It's plastic. It is driven by its author, namely the creative mind, creative cosmic mind. So Sankhya proposes 24 cosmic principles. By understanding these 24 cosmic principles, we can use it as a ladder to go back, back, back to finer and finer and finer aspects of our reality. Let us start with the place where we are, the waking state. The waking state has a body. The body has faculties, sense organs on the outside, a complex system of taking information in instantly, making connections and stimulating some activity in response to circumstances. So there are objects, five objects are there, that's 16 items, and 16 items plus a mind, uh, so 15 items plus a mind, 16. Then we have all egos, that is, all senses of individual identities, that's 17. Then we have five subtle elements, all compounding in a finer and finer way until we get to Akasha. Akasha, a kind of space, a kind of ether, a kind of field that contains many, many subtle things with many different frequencies, but very, very subtle, hardly noticeable. Something like a small ripple that erupts and combines, and then we get the other four. And it doesn't mean, say, we left the origin thing before, behind. No, it was included, compounded, and brings us forward. That is why, across the line, as it were, in the objects that we see, space is there. It is Agasha presenting itself dominantly. Air is there. It is Vayu expressing itself dominantly. It is radiation, light, expressing itself as light, expressing Tejas or Agni, fire, light. It is all that, the, the water expressing liquidity. If it wasn't for this liquidity in the human body, we wouldn't be able to move. It's like a tire filled with pressure or filled with air, it, it gives it some shape. And so we are thankfully made mostly from water and water molecules. So there's a dominance of that, 
And then there's a dominance of solid things, rocks, the earth, all of that is there. It's the concrete gross version of the subtle element behind it. And it's all compounded to be almost one and the same. It's no surprise we find exactly the same gross elements, whether it's on the moon, whether it's Mars, whatever it is. We find the same gases on the gaseous planets. It's not a surprise. There's nothing new there. It's all within the same thing. The configuration is different. And thankfully, the configuration that we have is completely suitable for discovering the highest element of our nature, our own nature. And then where does all this come from? So we have another five. It's 22 elements. What is 23? 23 is cosmic mind, cosmic consciousness, cosmic Christ, cosmic Buddha. This is all the same being. It is this personal God. It is this Ishta Devata that you're talking about. Is it separate from the others? No. It uses its own material, like a spider weaving a web from its own self. It doesn't require a Mrs. Spider. It doesn't require some external manufacturing section. It's doing it from itself. Creating from itself. It is the creator creating from itself. That means wherever we look, whatever uh, divisional um, faction we take of the whole thing that we've described so far, we can see it. This is the one thing. It is God or Goddess. It is that being that we worship. And we can then have the insight. It is as when Sri Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita describes all the various aspects of nature, namely himself. He doesn't say in, he says as. I am the science, the science of the self. I am the thunderbolt. I am this and that. Not I'm in, I am. And so it brings forward elements of this pure being. And all of that gets resolved into a potentiality. The impersonal God, we call this the headline, which is Prakriti. And everything else is a variety, variation of this Prakriti. And where does that come from? It comes from this set of conditions that creates this relative world. And when we leave that behind, we find only the absolute existing. Only Brahman is there. Brahman alone exists. Brahmasmi, I am that Brahman. Brahman alone exists. It is what we call the Atman in ourselves. That's all that there is looking like various things. Whatever we experience is simply a reflection of that. Now, these are the principles, the discoveries, that conform not only to our logic, but conform to the experience of those great saints and mystics, those great discoveries who had the insight and the intuition. And we also can get it by following the same formulas. What are the formulas? Sincere prayer repeating lovingly the divine holy name, giving your whole energies or registering them to the divine, re-registering and revaluing the whole of this existence, be it in the waking state or the dream or the dreamless sleep, as aspects of this same divine, so that whoever you stand in front of and whatever circumstances there, you can easily go through a tracing 24 steps, and there you can discover the divine. Now, if you can want to add one more, you say it's the soul, jiva. And you have three options, relational options. You can either see that divine as separate, in which case you're tapping into the honey that comes with worship. Or you can see that it is absolutely connected. That, that we are a part of that Supreme, or you can see it as only one without a second. These three positions are not contradictory. They are supplementary. After all, if you climb a mountain, you won't be able to see the whole vista that you'll see from the top of the mountain. You'll only be able to see whatever 
the elevation require, uh, allows you. And then the higher you go, the more you see. This is our spiritual journey. The higher we go, the more we see. Or if you want to use the deeper, the deeper analogy, the deeper we go, the more we discover, the more profound, the more subtle, the more truthful, until we get to a unity of existence. But we have to see this in practical life. We have to see God in everyone, standing there and as everyone. Go that step further, in and through and as and beyond. This is the process, step by step. I don't think God is a bad investor. I think God has, desire, has kept you going. Your destiny is on your hands, on your fingerprints, and on the lines of your hands. And your destiny is there. And I think God is investing in you. Why else would you be alive and functioning? And I don't think that God is a bad investor. That's something that we have to endorse and keep going all the time. And when our job is done, when our particular function in this world is done, then, of course, we then uh, go into the, the, the wonderful, uh, that wonderful area, as it were, of the divine. Uh, so, okay, uh, I think I may have answered your question, but maybe not. So let me know. Yes, Swami, I think everything um, has a term in life. Like, for example, when we wear socks, they at some point get broken and you have to get new socks. A bottle of water as well gets emptied and so on. Um, it is, I think it's hard sometimes when it's a big figure emotionally. And I think also if you have certain very strong experiences linked to that figure to kind of like change the reality because change is so like difficult to go through when it's something like very, like something remarkable. So uh, supposing you uh, take a journey on a boat, um, do you expect it to be like glass? Even if you break through the glass, you'll find some disturbance and waves. So yes, come, come. Yes, come. Yeah. We will call our family. Yeah, all right. Uh, so we, we don't expect uh, smoothness in this world. It's not designed like that. You know, if you take children to a fun fair and you put them in a moving car and you tell them, well, you just sit there and they'll say, well, is it going to move? No, no, it doesn't move. And you say, well, what does it do? Well, it's not allowed to move. We don't want it to move in case you hurt yourself. You see, then what kind of funfair is that? And not only do people want to move, they want to be thrust upside down. <laughs> and, uh, you know, go a beautiful shade of green and all that. So what's the point of that? You see, there's a thrill. And you'll find funfairs universally everywhere. See? So... Also, Swami, um... This is something that I realized when I came here to Spain because I was looking for a yoga studio, like Hatha Yoga, Vinyasa, so on. Um, and I met a few teachers that did once Hatha, other ones did Vinyasa, other ones Hatha with Vinyasa. And I realized there was one particular teacher that I... I, I, I don't know why, I think, but I saw this teacher twice and the first time I felt like something like really strong, but it was disturbing me. 
I couldn't close my eyes, so I couldn't do the practice. And then I, then kind of I watched that feeling inside me, because uh, he he said to me, "No, but close your eyes." But I said, "No, I can't." Like I couldn't trust. And then the second time that I saw this teacher, I was in rock pose, sitting with my knees, and then. He was going to start the class and he gave the instruction and I felt my body completely blocked. It was like my body didn't want to move or open with this person in front. And then I had to leave the class and I'm really sorry, but I, I, I don't have the energy. But I did have the energy because I could walk. So that made me actually think and wonder how important is the teacher with the right that would be suitable for one person or have to pure intentions because I was thinking maybe it was a person that didn't have pure intention you know in a class and you you okay. open up kind of you connect so the that, yoga brings practice. A, that brings a kind of a different question and a, a wider question is there a necessity for a teacher and if so what what are the characteristics to look for for a teacher in any sense? Because you see, if you want to learn Indian classical music, you require a guru, and it's referred to as a guru. But guru means is a is a dual word. It means you know darkness to light. There's a transition. It indicates that the guru is able to take you by torchlight and say, okay, and show you a way out, show you your freedom and allow you to take over and access your own freedom. And yet it's still applied in every context to music, for example, to dancing. Uh, so all of the people in India learning classical dancing, music and so on, will all have a guru. Uh, even though it's a spiritual thing. Now, why should that be? How does learning music relate to spiritual life? It is because, and I'm using it as a good example, in Indian uh, cultural life, everything is spiritual. All the dance is not just a secular dance. The dance is telling a, let's say, mythological tale and is spiritual in nature. Uh, same thing with music. Now you see, how do you find a teacher like that? Well, let us take, for example, the famous sitar player, Ravi Shankar. Ravi Shankar is a wonderful teacher because he's a wonderful musician, and he also knows how to convey that. And music has a spiritual value. But is it that teacher that is suitable to lead you on in spiritual life? No. So how did people select him as a teacher? They selected him for his competence. And therefore, what is a guru? A guru is a competent teacher in every sense, whether it's in, in terms of yoga exercise or music or anything. So let's take yoga exercise since you gave that example. So one of the most popular importations from India throughout the whole of the world is yoga exercise. And I don't know anything about all these other descriptions of this yoga exercise because they're all to do with variations and traditions and so on and so forth. And I know really very little about that. What I do know is that there is a system called Hatha Yoga from which all of these are derived. And so it is necessary to find out from any competent teacher who was your competent teacher and who was your competent teacher. And so when selecting a teacher in any sphere, that's the first question you ask, who was your teacher? And who was his teacher? What is your lineage? It's a bit like matchmaking, you know, understanding what is your parentage and, uh, you know, all of that kind of thing. So yes, that's the first question you ask. And the second thing is you ask, for signs, what does that mean? Well, in the area of music, 
the teacher may ask, do you have a musical ear? <laughs> if you don't, well, then maybe, you know, it's not a good idea to pick up music at all. If you want to be uh, to uh, paint pictures and a person says, well, I'd love to. Oh, I have to tell you, I'm colorblind. Ah, well, then, you know, the type of uh, picture I was going to recommend for you, uh, it's, it's different. Maybe you should take something up which doesn't involve color. Same thing with spirituality. In a di spiritual direction, you say, all right, a competent teacher established through lineage, who doesn't have any selfish motive, who is uh, capable because they themselves have seen God, they themselves have experienced the highest uh, experience in spiritual life and so on. And you can usually tell from how they look and so on sometimes, but certainly how they speak and definitely how they behave. And then you see, you accept them provisionally as a teacher and there'll be a synergy there. And there's an expectation about the student also. The student has to have a strong desire to be taught. The student has to have, in fact, a yearning for the truth or for God. They have to have a sense of discernment. They have to send a sense of detachment. They have to have certain moral, ethical qualities, certain things, certain levels of concentration, for example, forbearance, for example, uh, simple living or uh, pure living, so on. Uh, all of these are described as, let's say, six treasures. So four things are required for the student in spiritual life. Now, what about a teacher teaching Hatha Yoga? Originally, you have to understand the reason why Hatha Yoga is designed is to gain mastery over the body in order for you to sit and concentrate in meditation. That's the reason for it. So one question I normally ask yoga groups that I meet with for the first time, and I have quite a few now, and I ask them, what has yoga to do with health and wellness? And sometimes for them, it's a surprise question. It's a question I ask at uh, the European Union for Yoga and when I go there in Switzerland. And I ask, what has health and wellness got to do with uh, yoga? They think it's everything. And I have to answer my own question. Hardly anything. And then I tell them the reason why. Hatha yoga practitioners are trying to control and master the, the body and the energy expression through the body and through the lungs and through the cells of the body and so on and so forth, the kopranayama and all that, in order for you to sit and concentrate and meditate. It's purely for meditation purposes. Now, the difficulty with it is, if it's not read in this light, then it can make you body conscious instead of God conscious. So it depends what teacher you want to select. And uh, a teacher will have to have other conditions, no doubt, because all teachers have to have an element of understanding the person that they're teaching. Um, in physical exercise, there are other aspects. Other aspects being, well, uh, did you ask me what is my physical condition as your student, as your pupil? Did you ask me if I have high blood pressure? Did you go through a whole list? Did I have to sign a disclaimer form, for example? That is one of the, the signs that, that is required because many people have had their health ruined by incompetent teachers. What is your lineage? Who taught you? Where was your teaching? Where's your certificate? Where's your insurance? And all of these things, that is applicable in the Western world. It's not applicable necessarily in Indian cultural life. And the, the reason is because the, Hatha, the original Hatha yogis, they never got certificates or diplomas. They were in a Gurukula system where the teacher was selected for their competency and they saw the results from it. 
So uh, these are things in general for teachers, teachers, students. And uh, because you specifically brought up Hatha Yoga, this is the understanding. Why do we as devotees want anything to do with physical exercise or kriyas or anything like this? We want it because we have to clean the house. The house is called the body. And we clean it on the outside and no doubt we clean it on the inside. And we do that by moving the lymph around through bending and twisting, in short, yoga asanas. And we take the proper diet. It's not just that, proper diet. We pray, take proper measures to make sure that the body is not accumulating toxic material and encumbrances in it. Make sure that the toxic waste is removed. You know, there was a man called Alex Scarrow who won a Nobel Prize. What he did was he took some cells of a chicken's heart and kept them going for 10 years in laboratory conditions by measuring and exactly what micronutrients should go in and what micronutrients should come out, what waste products should come out, and keep the temperature and pH conditions going and so on and so forth. And the only reason why they only lasted 10 years was he just made his point and ended the experiment. But the theory was, you can theoretically, given these conditions, allow these cells in the body to live perpetually. Why not humans also? So looking after the health with the understanding of the mortality of the body is a good thing and prepares us for spirituality prepares us for the flexibility to sit for hours together if necessary in meditation. That's why we do it. So I think we have to be careful about people, proponents of uh, uh, yoga, Hatha Yoga and so on and so forth, you know, and see uh, exactly why, why they're teaching and what they're teaching and so on and so forth. I hope you select somebody nice. Thank you, Tommy. So the first thing, of course, is to ask questions, you know. You have a list of questions in advance of what your competent teacher will look like, what qualities they will have, what they're going to teach, and why they should, why they feel they should teach. <laughs> so I'm happy to take any more questions if they're there. Thank you, Swamiji, for answering mine. Mm. Maybe a small question, Swamiji, because you, you you just told us that in India, everything in daily life is spiritual, and it's quite difficult for us to to do just, just once a day. So what could be a technique just to, to get spirituality without just saying some ritual things? And, which are, have no sense, you know, and just to try to think about God sometimes in, during the day. Well, let's uh, analyze what the components are, cultural components are in India. If you go to any town or village, you will find uh, religious shrines everywhere. That means you'll find enough reminders of your spiritual nature everywhere and of the life of devotion everywhere. Now, of course, uh, there is a phrase, familiarity breeds contempt. So there is a possibility, of course, also, that uh, too much of something makes you not even notice it. But in any case, whether it's East or West, we need elements of resolve. We need to be aware of where our attention is going. And these shrines and pictures all over the place, for example, in a shop, an Indian shop in India, you, or even outside India, where you have an Indian-owned shop, or a Hindu-owned shop, I should say, then there you'll find at least a picture of Lakshmi there, or Ganesha there, something will be there. And it's not just that something was stuck there, it was part of the dedication of that shop. And that means every time they enter into the shop, 
they make a pronounce there and they light an incense stick or a lamp or something of that nature. And their first thought then is that this business belongs to God. Now, everybody can do that. Everybody can open up their business or their office or their computer. And the first thought is before they enter work, fold the palms and make a prayer. And in this way, you make all actions spiritual, understanding that all our energy comes from there. So, yes, there are elaborate rituals, temple worship, there is sandhya, some people practice, some people don't. But everywhere you look in India, there will be signs and indications and pictures and things that will stimulate the imagination, artistic, cultural things that are designed to stimulate the thought of God and to make it interesting and artistic enough for us to do that. Now, from childhood, of course, children have been taught mythological stories, uh, not necessarily the meanings. In the West, we want to know the meanings of it, and that's good. Everybody should know the meanings of these things. So you might just, uh, out of great interest, out of uh, your own experimentation, Find out what you can do, putting a picture somewhere, carrying a picture, car uh, wearing your mala, where you do japa, doing japa more frequently in a formal way, but also doing japa continuously. Now, somebody has challenged me on that. How can you do japa continuously when you have to concentrate on unit activities? Well, yes. But what about before the activity and after the activity or before the activity? You know, when we were at school, we used to write, have to write on the top of every paper that we wrote on, M-A-D-J, which was Latin for the greater glory of God. All activities have to be done like that. So regularity in your morning meditation and your evening meditation. And, um, throughout the day, filling up with loving thoughts of God by repeating his holy name and also repeating his glories, looking at his glories, finding God everywhere in every face and every situation. So we can do exactly the same. It doesn't matter if you're in India or anywhere else. Now, in Spain, for example, uh, where Marina is, is very similar. There are churches everywhere, there are statues everywhere. In Ireland, you go and you see on a street corner, oh, there's the, there's the Mother Mary, for example. Everywhere you'll find it. There's a reason for that. In the ancient days in uh, Christianity, well, throughout the world, reading and writing was uh, an, uh, reserved for the educated people, the pundits and the priests and so on, the scholars. And so how do we educate the people, build huge, great, great churches, cathedrals, and temples, which tells the story that you want to do, like reading a book, and uh, so on. So fill, fill the mind up strategically. Fill the mind with God and practice God's presence all the time, everywhere, by calling his name. That's what we do. And you see the mantra is not just repeating the name, it's repeating it with an element of feeling and thankfulness. So that every moment of your day is filled with whatever the activity may be, whether it's a routine activity or a specific activity. We make it all, we discover the spirituality in all these things because every act, action is inherently spiritual. Every word is potentially spiritual. <laughs> All our speeches, the capacity to speak has a spiritual insertion of energy in it, divine energy in it. It's to recognize it, to go beyond the surface of what we, the interface, in the computer science we call it interface, isn't it, I think, to go beyond the interface and see what's behind. All right. Om oh, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, 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 Thank peace. You, Thanks. Thank you, Swami. Thank you, Swami Ji. Thank you, Swami Ji.